I think I have the best piece of advice for you then. Okay. <laughs> I want you to start to trust your your body. Okay. Okay, because it will it will lead you in the right direction. It sounds like you have a good grasp of of how you feel and and how to feed yourself. So I, I'm just from talking to you, it sounds like you're doing pretty good. Trust your body because if you don't, what'll end up happening or what can happen, I've seen this many times, is that someone's doing great, but because they don't trust their own body, they hop on this diet or they try this new thing and then they ignore the signals that their body tells them because, well, this is okay. what I'm supposed to do. Like, I just told you to eat 90 grams of protein a day. Well, what if you aim for 90 grams of protein and you get constipated? You don't feel okay. good. Like, ignore that, right? You, then listen to your body. Maybe less protein yeah. is, is what you need. Although I don't think so. I'm just using that as an example. Right. But, but trust your body. It's going to lead you um, in the right direction. It's giveaway time, Map Symmetry again, because it's the new program we just released. Remember, this program works on symmetry and balance in the body, utilizing isometrics, unilateral training, and then five by five training. So that's the free program we're giving away right now. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and then turn on notifications. Do all those things. And if we like your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to Map Symmetry. Now, everyone else, this is a brand new program launch, which means it's on sale. So it normally will retail for $177. Right now, it's only $97. Plus, we're throwing in two free eBooks, The Muscle Building Secrets of Isometrics and Reverse Dieting 101. You get all that for $97 with Map Symmetry, but the sale ends in two days, okay? The sale ends on the 17th. So if you want to get started, do it now. Save some money. Get all that free stuff. Head over to mapsymmetry.com and then use the code SYM50 for that discount. All right, here comes the rest of the show. If you have a slow metabolism and you want to speed it up, one of the key things you need to do is to eat in a calorie surplus. It's almost impossible to speed up your metabolism when you're eating in a deficit. Maybe one of the single most important things that I learned as a trainer to help my clients out and that I didn't understand the first, you know, five to seven years of training. Like this is just... Uh, it seems uh, the opposite of what you would yeah, do, totally. right? Someone comes in, they sit across from you. They're struggling for, they can't focus lose on building the body first. Yeah, I need, like I need to lose 50 pounds. Mm -hmm. So we just assume that they're, they're grossly overeating and not moving enough. And so, okay, let's move more. Let's eat less calories. And what always ended up happening, for at least for me, in my experience, was I'd get this client who was already eating very low calorie. And even if I did get them to adhere to the diet and eat in a calorie restriction, and we did see some results, it, a, a plateau was on the horizon and it was well before <clears throat> they ever reached their goal. And they were at this uh, calorie consumption that was just not sustainable long-term. Exactly. Because what happens, the reason why your metabolism slows down or speeds up is it's just adapting uh, to your lifestyle. And by feeding yourself low calories, you're telling your body, hey, it's you need to keep this metabolism slow. In fact, you need to slow it down even, even more. You need to become more efficient. So if you want to speed it up, you literally have to do the opposite. You have to feed yourself a little more. Now, of course, simultaneously, you want to do strength training so that those extra calories go to muscle. Otherwise, they'll go to body fat. But as you're feeding the muscle, the metabolism speeds up. You can't build muscle in a calorie deficit. So sometimes people say, well, I'm lifting weights, but I'm lifting weights. Why isn't my metabolism going any faster? It's like, well, you're still eating too little. You have to give those building blocks to your body so that it can actually do something with it, turn it into active tissue, which is muscle, and speed up your metabolism. So the, the, the process should look like a slight calorie surplus. So wherever your maintenance is, eat a little more than that, and then do some strength training and get stronger. And then what will happen is your metabolism will, will react by getting faster, by burning more calories. And then here's what happens. Instead of what Adam said, which is, you know, you, you cut your calories from where you're at and then you plateau real hard and, uh oh and now I'm stuck in this low calorie. Now you've boosted your metabolism. You have a long way to go. You can cut calories and still be eating a normal amount of food, if you will, way more room and way less likely to plateau. And I think the reason why it was such a difficult conversation, besides the fact that they're coming in there to lose weight, is just the the time a lot of it takes to, to really repair and build the metabolism yes. to get it roaring uh, as it should. Is If you've been in a calorie deficit for so long, which a lot of my clients coming in had been for like years sometimes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think the greatest challenge is for the client? Like it's a- uh, Oh, the, the hardest thing is that it goes a, a completely opposite from what they thought they needed to do. And what you're essentially telling the client is, hey, for the next few months, 
we're actually going to not lose any weight. Yeah, and potentially gain weight. Yeah, you might gain five yeah. pounds, and we're not going to lose any weight, but you're going to get stronger, you get more fit. And yeah. It's really hard pill to swallow because you got to consider this. The average person has been thinking about getting in shape or thinking about losing weight for a while before they actually take that first step. So then they're finally ready. That's it. I'm ready to lose weight. Then they talk to a smart trainer and the trainer's like, well, it's going to, you know, you have to build a base here for about three or four months or longer before you attempt to lose weight. And it's like, I just want to, I don't want to hear that. Yeah, we'll talk about a, a, a major mental hurdle that these clients have to go through too. Cause you figure that mo most of these people have a body image issues when they come to you too. Totally. So you have body image issues and then you tell them they're going to increase their calories and yeah, there's a, a lot of times that will make their clothes fit a little bit tighter and the scale mm -hmm. might go up a couple pounds. I just, that's so, even if you can get buy-in, like, okay, it sounds like you know what you're talking about. Okay, it makes that makes sense. I understand why we're doing it. But then that that's the first hurdle. Then you get over that hurdle that it's like you have to let them know when they come to you like, I'm not liking this. My clothes are fitting tighter. Yeah, I noticed the scale totally. was up a pound. Yeah, yeah, think about it this way, right? If you've ever seen a house get built um, from scratch, <laughs> or you, pick, you pick a lot of land and then you want to see the house get built. And at first it looks like not much is being done. If you've ever watched a house getting built, you're like, where's the, where's the structure? Because they're, they're, they're setting the foundation. They're building the base, right? Mm -hmm. Then things start to speed up and they start to build the actual house. Imagine if there was no base, right? Imagine if there was no foundation, you would start to see the structure, but it would fall apart very mm -hmm. quickly and you wouldn't have yourself a house. So what we're setting ourselves up for by doing it this way, by getting your metabolism to speed up, through eating a slight surplus and training for strength as we're setting the foundation so that this house that we build doesn't fall. You know why I like that analogy so much too? Because there, there are some other things or other parallels with uh, fat loss too, is that it, it, the foundation piece is slow and, yes. you know, very methodical and you're, you're going to level everything out totally. and you're plumbing everything and you're getting, but the framing aspect actually goes pretty quick. It's a yeah. snowball, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So once you get to the place where it's like, it okay, it's exciting. Then, yeah. Right? Everything's level set. We got everything lined up. Perfect. Now we just got to slap these two by fours together. The framing process of building a house is relatively quick in comparison to it, which is how, how I would explain that to them with the fat loss. And mm -hmm. like, listen, it's going to seem a little slow at first, but while we're getting everything lined up the way we want to but boy once we decide that it's time to start really losing body fat watch how quick it starts to this, happen this is how effective fat loss typically looks like it starts off slow and then it's got this kind of snowball effect and as you progress it happens faster and faster and with less effort it actually starts to feel more and more effortless as your metabolism is working for you on the flip side this is what bad fat loss looks like very quick and then a hard plateau. And then it requires more effort and more work to squeeze out every single pound. And then you're stuck in this position where maintenance, you know, maintaining is almost impossible. This is a big part of the reason why almost everybody fails with this. If you look at the statistics on this, over 80% of people gain the weight back within the first uh, couple of years. And I would even extend that to 90% if we follow them just long enough. It's like everybody gains it back. Nobody sets the foundation. That's well, why. another major hurdle too, though, is the the temptation on the the trainer and the coach's part because yeah. it's, it's totally. very tempting for them to uh, get a client to re-sign or sign up for them for more sessions by showing them quick results. Yeah, you can show someone a quick 10-pound loss. Yeah, as, I mean, easily by taking somebody who was relatively sedentary, not eating very well, changing their diet, reducing calories, getting them exercising, whether it be cardio or weight training, mm -hmm. you can show that person who came in and said, hey, I want to lose 50 pounds, a quick 5 to 10 pounds, real quick. And a lot of times they get excited and then that's where they, they'll continue training. So part of the, part of the challenge uh, is that the co trainers and coaches take the easy path a lot of times because they, they know that if I just get, if I get yeah. this, per if I do the motivation thing and I hype them up and I get them pushing and sweating and play that role, and then they get to see the scale heading in the direction that they ultimately want, then it's easier for me to convince them to keep training with me versus overcoming all the things that we're talking about. Like, yeah, this is going to take longer than you wanted. Oh, by the way, I want you to eat more instead of less. Oh, by the way, we're probably not going to see any results for a couple of months as yeah. far as weight loss is concerned. I mean, nobody really Disgruntled wants to hear that. clients, is, it's a tough place to be. Yeah. Right? And that's a tough, uh, especially for new trainers or trainers that are like, you know, dependent on this, uh, you know, paycheck to paycheck 
uh, type of mentality where like you're trying to please your client to keep them coming back. And so you're tempted to then, you know, pull those things out to make them feel this temporary weight loss. And now I'm happy and now we can keep progressing. But, you know, when in fact the best thing for them is this long-term yeah, approach. My, yeah. So my dad does stonework. This is what he grew up doing since he was a kid, right? Now he stopped doing it because he's got injuries now as a result. He's done it his whole life. But he's from the old world, right? And he does it in a way where if he does your shower or your bathroom, it's going to look incredible and it's going to last a long time. And I would go to, I would go on these jobs with him where people would say things like, well, I could hire these other people. They'll do it way faster and it's going to be much cheaper. My dad would be like, you can do that, but you're going to be calling me up to come fix it and tear it down and put my stuff up. And most people would listen to him because he was confident and they, he was referred, but sometimes they wouldn't. And I used to love going back to these people. And they'd, we'd show up and they'd be like, you were right. You're right. They, they did yeah. a crappy job. I'm sorry. You know, I got to pay you to tear it down or whatever. And that's exactly what you got to say as a, as a trainer, as a coach. You have to be confident. You're the expert. You're the one guiding them where they want to go. So what happens is they think they know what they want, but they just don't know because they're ignorant to it. People don't understand what the process looks like. So you have to educate them. Otherwise, you're not doing them any, any service. In fact, what you might be doing, and oftentimes what happens is, you're getting someone closer to never trying again because a person will only try so many times and fail before they're like, this isn't for me. You know, I've lost weight and gained it back three, four times. I'm done. I'm not going to try this anymore. So if you're a coach or trainer watching this, uh, your job is to make sure that it, it, it works this time and that they stay because we know the, the positive benefits of all this. By the way, reverse dieting, there's a little bit more nuance to it. It's not just eating over a surplus. There's a, a, a process by which you increase your calories gradually over time to minimize fat gain. We have an ebook called uh, Reverse Dieting 101. Uh, at the moment, it's not being sold, but we will sell it later on. But right now it's for free with the MAPS Symmetry program launch. So we launched a new program and that is going to be free with it along with the uh, Isometrics uh, book. So you'll get those two for free with Symmetry. So if you're trying to build your metabolism, you can follow what that book says along with a program like MAPS Symmetry and you'll see some pretty good metabolism boosting results. Doug, did you did you guys settle yeah. in on what that will be sold for after the launch? It's forty seven dollars. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, each okay. book will be forty seven each. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you okay. get them both for free with the whole thing. So yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. All right, you guys want to hear some cool red light therapy studies? I found some really good. Something ones. new? I know. It just seems like all these benefits. Uh, they're they're studying so many different benefits that I've never even considered that it provides. There's always a new one. Well, so this is a this is a review of studies, which is really good, right? So red light is a, a type of light um, that has some very interesting effects on the body. So when you shine a particular frequency of red light, it's not just any red light, right? There's this particular frequency uh, and, and intensity. When you shine it on your body, it literally power it powers up your mitochondria. So your mitochondria are the like the power houses of your cells. Think of them as the engines. They create the 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 energy of a cell. The They're what makes cells yeah. healthy. It's mitochondria that are unhealthy causes disease and illness. And you may hear this if you're in the in the biohacking community about healthy mitochondria. So it's really interesting. You shine red light on any cell, which all cells are operated with uh, or are or, or fueled by mitochondria, and the mitochondria get powered up by this red uh, this now, red light. Now, is this because it's mimicking like what the sun does for us, or is it totally different? It's The sun does emit a certain amount of this red light, but when you use red light therapy, it's concentrated. It's, a, for lack of a better term, a hack. Now, it's been widely studied... So, okay, so we work with a company called Juve that makes uh, the kind of red lights that are done in these studies. And when we first started working with them, it all sounded like mumbo jumbo. It sounded like baloney, like this is this can't be real. I did some research. These studies go way back to the 70s. They've been around for a long time. We were studying this stuff uh, for, for decades, so it's not like brand new stuff. What's new is that you can get stuff like this for your house. Back then you couldn't, it was impossible. But anyhow... Incredible! It's very safe, so it's been tested for safety, and it powers up the mitochondria. And so I, I brought up this article that from WebMD. So it's a WebMD article that reviews all the studies, and essentially, and WebMD is a very conservative site, right? So they're only going to post things where studies are like, oh yeah, this definitely does something. They're not going to do stuff like that. Oh, it's speculated, Nothing controversial. Really. Yes, it's all. So check this out. It improved dementia. One study people with uh, dementia who got regular near-infrared light therapy on their heads or through their noses, okay, sounds crazy, for 12 weeks had better memories, slept better, and were angry less often. So the red light can penetrate 
uh, parts of the body get to certain cells, fuel them, and this seems to be what happened in the brain. Yeah. Another one, dental pain. People what? with dental pain uh, no or who have TMD, right? You guys know what TMD is? I thought it was TMJ. It was TMD. No, t TMD is a tempo, uh, temporomandibular dysfunction syndrome. So like yeah. clicking jaw tenderness. Yeah. They saw improvement. Hmm. Hair loss, we know about this already, right? Hair loss. Why are you uh, glad okay. you pointed Why you gesture to me, asshole? <laughs> <laughs> you see, it's visible. Yeah. <laughs> hey, bald guy over there. Hey. More red light. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Red light, um, dude. For 24 weeks, there was significant hair regrowth yeah. uh, in people. Osteoarthritis reduced osteoarthritis pain by more than 50% in one study, which is huge. Tendinitis reduced inflammation and pain with uh, in people with Achilles tendinitis. Um, and then wrinkles and acne scars, burns, and stuff like that. Tremendous improvement. It's so interesting. It just seems like any cell in your body, like you could sort of power up and, and boost uh, efficiency. Uh, you know, from because I mean, you shine on your balls, you produce more testosterone. That's true. Like it's it's like you just it, it, you just pick certain areas and sections that you want to hyper focus on. And it's like it has all these it's benefits. So now, weird. now, what I would be really interested to see is some sort of a study that compared like two groups of people, like a group of people that were completely deprived of sunshine uh, consistently for like you know weeks or maybe even months, and they and they supplemented with a red light, or somebody who got you know ample amount of sunlight every single day, mm -hmm. and then also using conjunction. Would we see uh, a discrepancy between the yeah, two? Yeah, so I, there was a study, I don't have it in front of me, but there was a study that compared uh, full spectrum UV, so like what you get from the sun, yeah. to just red light, and the yeah. red light was superior for the things that I listed because it's concentrated. Now, mm -hmm. that doesn't supply, it doesn't replace the sun, obviously. Sunlight has got its own benefits, and we need it. But you know what's weird about this is it makes me feel like we're plants. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know. You know, like sunlight it's, does certain things to plants. We're and living, yeah, cells. I mean, it's not that far-fetched. It's weird. It's like the mitochondria feed on this red light and then become more active and healthier. So think about any cell in your body. If the mitochondria is healthier and more energized, whatever that cell does, it then st starts to do it better. So if it's a, a skin cell... Skin's going to be, you know, replenishing faster. If it's for muscle, muscle is going to heal faster. If it has to do with testosterone production, like the light cells, have they in the done testicles? any studies for gut health and just like shining it there? That's a good stomach, question. I, I don't wonder. know if it could penetrate that deep. Yeah, because I know it goes pretty deep, but that would be pretty. pretty that'd be pretty deep. I mean, I I feel better right after I do it. So very similar to the same feeling I get if I go get sunshine for you know thirty minutes to an hour. Mm. Like it, I just feel better after I I do it. So mm. I wonder if it's that similar in that way. Yeah. And I imagine if you did that study, that of course you would see. Uh, you know, they probably both would improve. What I really want to know is how big I, of a difference I, is I, My theory is that if you are deprived of the sun, I think this becomes crucial. Oh, I see what you're saying. So yeah. I, it's, I, I think, I mean, we, you could... I probably. Mean, it sounds right? like what you're alluding to is that they, they both show improvement regardless yeah. if you got sun or not. But I would think that somebody who is deprived of sunlight... Like if you is, work in an office all yes, the time. And, yes, yeah. and you're not getting any uh, uh, any sunlight really much at all. That makes I, sense. I would think that you would get a dramatic improvement. Or like that. if you live in a in a place where there's not much sun at all. <clears throat> right. Uh, like Because you see a lot of symptoms of that, like depression and anxiety is higher in those right, places. Right, right. I wonder if red light therapy. Yeah, they usually supplement yeah. heavy with but, vitamin D. Dude, back in the day, though, I mean, not that long ago, if you wanted like the real clinical red light therapy panels, they're like twenty grand. You like you couldn't buy it. It was pretty pretty much you weren't going to buy it for your yeah. house. But now, obviously, they have companies you, like Juve that provide them. Don't it's try painting uh, lights at your house red either. It's no, <laughs> and there's a it's not going to work out. For and there's it. a particular frequency and type. So you have to really be there's careful. Medical grade, and then there's all the other shit. Right? And then there's all the other stuff that really doesn't do. I mean, they sell combs and hats and stuff, and it's just not going to. You, you knew it was getting. It, you know, I knew it was going mainstream when you start to see it on shows now. I, there's been a handful yeah. of shows now that I've seen that have so many professional teams are yeah. incorporating it now because it's just so much benefit to the recovery process in mm. general. So yeah, it's totally. crazy. Yeah. Oh, speaking of studies, ah, uh, this is really cool. So this goes. This is right into that bucket of be science based but not science bound. Okay, so what what did the That's studies a shirt waiting to happen? I know. I mean, we'll, we'll credit. Sorry, to Max Lugavere, we're taking your yeah, quote. We, we, are, are, it's too good. Are you going to share the one that about that you tagged Lane in? Because I want you. to No, talk about no, that. I'll oh. bring that up in a second. Okay, but okay. I, I I have to look a little deeper actually into that before I I have my my strong opinion. 
So I'm actually asking Lane's opinion on it. It was a study on artificial sweeteners that oh, showed right. there may be some metabolic yeah, effects, but stay tuned. Um, and Lane's very good. He's very objective. So I'm going to wait. I'm waiting for his uh, reply. But no, I'm talking about, so let me ask you guys this, right? 10 years ago, 15 years ago, what was the consensus on low to moderate alcohol consumption? Like drinking a glass of red wine every day. What did they say? They were healthy. promoting it. It was yeah. good for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah the especially wine. Yeah, yeah, cause it yeah. resveratrol. And it's yeah. like not even a condensed version of, of resveratrol. No. So what it was, was studies showed that people who consumed low to moderate amounts of alcohol, like a glass of wine every night, lived longer than people who didn't. And so then, when, then what they did is they tried to figure out why. Well, what is it in the alcohol? It's got to be this uh, social component. It must be the social component, or maybe it's the resveratrol, or maybe it's the antioxidants. Right. Like what's going on? So this is the beauty of studies: is that it, that sometimes they'll give you a result and you don't realize that there's something else messing skewing right, the right. data. Kind of like the old cigarette coffee one. Yes, just like when they showed that coffee caused cancer, and because coffee drinkers back in the days all smoke cigarettes. So what they so we have better studies now with better controls, really good controls. Now that are coming out and conclusively showing that any alcohol consumption is bad for you. Like oh, any wow. amount is bad for you. Even a little bit is increases your risk of, of heart disease, cancer, and everything. It. We knew right? it. So, so, and we knew this. It's common sense, yeah. right? But now the social component, I get there's a, there's a quality of life thing there, and I'm fine with that. I mean, I'll drink alcohol sometimes, so I'm not being a zealot here. I'm just saying that the studies now are pretty clearly show that any alcohol is bad for you. So why then did those old studies show that a little bit of alcohol – made people longer. Well, they figured it out. Was it what you just alluded to? No, but they figured it out. You know what it was? What? Alcohol, people who drank alcohol, when they got really sick, like cancer or heart disease, stopped drinking alcohol. Then they died and they were put in the category of people that didn't drink alcohol. It skewed the data. What? So people, when they, drinkers, when they're getting really sick, tend to stop drinking. It's like, oh, I got cancer. Uh, I got heart disease. So now those people that die get put in the category of non-drinkers and it skewed the data so that it looked like alcohol consumer, uh, people who consume a little bit of alcohol, live longer. Uh, That's what it was. <laughs> That's so stupid. I know. That's so stupid. But you won't. You wouldn't think about that, right? If yeah. you don't control for that stuff, how can you? You wouldn't. Well, know. Yeah. Isn't that like the whole uh, back in the day? Everybody thought that everybody only lived a certain, like lived a lot younger. Like, oh, like oh. They, they died. They died a, a younger age. Yeah. But it was really just. <laughs> Because of uh, all the babies that died. Early. Yeah. So when you look at life expectancy in the past, like, yeah, oh, people only lived till they were 50. There were lots of people that were 70 and 80 years old. Yeah. But the life expectancy is low because so many children die, you know, before a certain age, yeah. which oh, so skews probably, the data. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So like if you made it to like, if you made it to 40, you were, you were you, very you're likely. More likely to keep going. Yeah. yeah. But if making it to like through childhood yeah, with they, all the childhood diseases and stuff was really hard. Yeah. They made uh, it sound <laughs> like every, like, like 40 was like the, like, today's 90 oh you know, that's but it's wild not the case no well, people I'm were sure glad you didn't bring that study up on a z-biotic commercial day yeah, with alcohol uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> actually well, we do have it for our yeah. do we really yeah. oh my yeah. god dude well hold on, hold on a second hold on a second way to go sell well, hold on a second we've never no 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 today. that's not funny we've all, we've never promoted <laughs> alcohol or or cannabis which you got you know we all use as a way to become uh, healthy. No, no, it's yeah. about quality of life. No, no. So, we, listen, yeah. I know we keep it real here. We keep it real. 100%. Right? I, mean, I, I was just keeping it real that that would be a terrible day to do I mean, shit, without, with alcohol, like, I would Ironically, hate- Ironically. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Isn't that yeah, hilarious? You're, you're going to hear a commercial <laughs> for that. I mean, the truth is that there's, uh, I mean, there's, there's millions of people listening and there's for sure of that, there's a percentage of people that don't give a fuck what we're saying. They're going to have yeah. some alcohol whether we like it or not. Hey, so if you're going to do it- Come on, dude. Do, do I'm it. the occasional guy. Yeah, come on, there's so. quality of life too. You, you, you can't Live, you have to enjoy certain things, and alcohol can do that. And it's a part of most religions. I don't know, in, in, in Christianity, I think there's thing. plenty of things that like that we all things. choose to do when we know it's not the healthiest or best thing for us. I just don't. I think I, I think it depends, right? It's it'd be the best at this moment. Like if I'm hanging out with my friends and I haven't seen you guys in a while, and we're yeah. loose and we're hanging out, and yeah, it's. It's a good thing to have a glass of wine or yeah. hang out or whatever. This has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but I wanted to shoehorn in some Antarctica facts. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've been holding on to these for a while. Like, you guys, this is like mind-blowing. You're just, me, just randomly yeah. uh, researching Antarctica? I mean, yeah, because who who's really paying attention? No you way. Know? Nobody. Yeah, there's like scientists that are down there That's where the lizard people live. Yeah, there's like 2,000 people there at any given time, just, you know, either military or scientists. And uh, I guess NASA, this is like 2019, so it's not super recent, but they had found a, a cavern 
underneath the ice sheet that's like as big as Manhattan. What? Yeah. So like it, you, it literally is could be thriving with life. Like you could grow plants and everything underneath the ice sheets because it's warm. What? It's temperate. It's like 70 something degrees what? because there's so many volcanoes. There's 90 something volcanoes, 91 volcanoes on this continent, right? Underneath all this ice, there's some of them that are active Wait, that how, are outside of it. Did they but, say how deep it was that they had to get to this? Yeah, they said, I don't know, like two, whatever, like metric system. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that where they found uh, kilometers or whatever the fuck? Isn't that where they found uh, Alien and Predator and the Alien versus Predator? No, what? That was, no, that wasn't where that oh, was. I remember that movie. Hey, yeah, 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 they go yeah. down the cavern, hey, right? Wasn't yeah. that? Hey, exactly. people, people make fun of Americans because we'll measure anything, <laughs> but that's it was not an English metric. article. I don't know. He's like, like it's, it's two city buses down. You know what exactly. Like, we'll any- <laughs> like make it relatable. Come on, it's a football field and a tennis court. Yes. that's how how deep it is. Uh, yeah, that's wild. So it's just underground. So it's under the ice. How cool is that? Temperate. Yeah. I'm like, I want to go there. I want to check this out. What are they going to find? They're, they're finding like caverns in certain pockets on, on the continent uh, now that they're kind of exploring. But yeah, this is, again, this does tie into like a lot of these <laughs> funny random conspiracy theories with like the whole base, like with the Nazis. Yeah. And, wasn't that a, a conspiracy? Uh, Operation High Jump and all this. Where they ended you never up heard battling that? No, no, there was this conspiracy theory that the Nazis had an underground Antarctica base. Yeah. After they lost, they went there and they're apparently infiltrating world governments or something like that, right? Yeah, and there's have been some crazy people that have have seen UFOs like like going into uh, these caverns and like the Google Earth has pictures of like holes, like random holes where the, the, they speculate that like spaceships can get in there or whatever but yeah it's it, it's great but did, all that aside this is what actually is there did you ever watch um i don't know why i thought of this uh was it return to the planet of the apes so this planet of the apes the original one do you guys ever watch the original one uh little bits of it oh, uh, God, yeah it's so oh, charlton heston yeah of course yeah, you did on. okay one of the greatest sci-fi movies of all time all your yeah. kids don't even understand one of the best movies of all time at the end you're just like what uh but the, then the, the sequels were crappy and one of them was he finds this like race of humans that are like worshiping like nukes. Remember that? Oh, yeah. With like bald and like uh, uh, underground. Yeah. That's what it made me think of. Oh uh, yeah. That's... So they go underground. I like the weird. Wahlberg ones. I thought those were good. No, they suck. Really? Yeah, they're uh, terrible. I like compared those. to the original one. No way, dude. I like your your guy that you have the man crush on. What? Uh, yeah. It's... Which one? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> He's got a bunch of man crushes. Yeah, what are you talking about? I never know his name. He's the one that's in like all those movies with like Seth. Uh, uh, whatever. Oh, whatever. Oh, DeFranco? Oh. Yeah, DeFranco. Yeah. Thank you. What was he what was, in? What was he in? Oh, he was the in the Planet, Planet of the Apes. Apes the that's reboot. Right. Yeah. Um, that's the one I'm talking about. Wahlberg was in the first one, right? Wahlberg, Wahlberg was in the in-between one. Yeah, in the between yeah. one. And then he's the next one, right? He, yeah. Bro, the original, the original Planet of the Apes blew people's minds. And, you know, here's a spoiler alert if you haven't seen it. He, it's like they're, they're astronauts. They go to space. They come back down to Earth, and they discover... Actually, sorry, I ruined it. Yeah. They go on a planet... And it's inhabited by these intelligent apes that yeah. and ride they a horseback. The humans, and they take them, and then they enslave them. And oh, there's humans on this planet, but none of them speak, and they're all mute, and they're weird. And I mean, it, but it, then he discovers that he actually went out into space, was in hypersleep or whatever, uh-huh. came back down to Earth thousands of years later. That was Earth, and humans had destroyed themselves. Right. That, I mean, that's what a, a great is, ending. Didn't they do the same? The Wahlberg is the is the remake of that. Yeah. The, no, Wahlberg. I thought Wahlberg. No, oh, same you're thing. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, was it was the same thing. Is a pure. He remake. crashes. He wakes up, and that's, that's exactly right. what it is. That's it's right. Earth, and he doesn't realize it. was like a yeah, a different concept. But yeah, it's same, not the same thing. Dude, did uh, I tell you, Justin, uh, about Adam's bitterness when we were on our trip? <laughs> what? In, my bitterness in, in Arizona. We, what was we that? Him grumpy? Was that what was he gets, about? He's so bitter about the fact that I could fall asleep. Oh yeah, uh, he's so mad about that. I, he, he I, I, I we get I on the plane. I openly admit that. Hey, we get on the plane. First off, like Adam now is like super bougie. He's like, I'm not yeah. flying anywhere unless yeah. it's you know at the front with a big seat or whatever. I'm doing his voice right. You guys get smashed by some big guy or something. I just have to do his voice right. I'm not going anywhere. And this is what he tells our assistant. So <laughs> Can't anyway, get like any drinks. Yeah. Apparently on the way back, there was nothing available. So we had to fly Southwest. So we're like, you know, doing this thing. Yeah. And you know me, I'll, I'll put my head back. He's still sleep. Right? Some stranger just fucking. Sa- Sal's the biggest man spreader. Did you notice that? By the way, his legs are always like smashing. I'm the, I'm the biggest, yeah. right? And I'm over yeah. this. There's me. And you see me like this. So, and you wonder why I'm all bitter. All and he's over there like this. The corner. 
Yeah. 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 Because yeah. he just, yeah, he's got a superpower. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of like, you know, when you're, when you're go to sleep and you snore and your wife wakes you up because she's pissed off. Well, now we're both not sleeping. Like, because you're just mad that I'm sleeping. <laughs> That's Adam. He, I can feel him yeah. looking at me like, mm. you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah it's, I'm it's like, you it's, dreaming right now? <laughs> yeah. I don't think the audience even understands. Like, there's, I've never in my life, okay, seen another human that can do this. Like, it is, mm. it, it, we don't even, we're not even off the tarmac before this guy is out. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, yeah. they weren't even done seating. So Sal and I sat down first. Yeah, of course, he, he sits <laughs> inside. I sit outside. Yeah. So there's a seat in the middle. So maybe we'll get lucky. And the whole plane starts Have to fill up. Have you ever checked like, Sal for wires? You know, he might yeah. be an android. The, well, Wait, he's I out. I just thought about the that. Other yeah. guy, the other guy comes to sit down between us. And to, for the like this, the end of the, uh, the people, like the last bit of line of people uh, are sitting down. And Sal is already out. He's out before <laughs> we're even coming close to You know up. what's weird about this? Like That's clockwork, amazing. Always. Dude. Can I tell you where I thought I developed this? When I was a kid, obviously I come from, I have a big family, right? So it's four kids and we, and my, my dad owned a crappy, well, my parents had a, a crappy minivan and I would always sit in the back and we'd go on road trips. We didn't have a lot of money. So it's like we flew places. We drive everywhere. So it's like mm. five hour drive sick and I'd get car sick. Always. You guys know that. I'll get, I'll get motion sickness real oh, easy. Yeah. So my mom used to be like, just fall asleep. Just fall asleep and you won't get this. So I literally trained myself in in vehicles to fall asleep. So now anytime I'm in something with an engine, <laughs> for some reason, it like lulls me to sleep. Dude, that's funny. Mine was never beneficial. I just would fall asleep in lectures all the time. <laughs> <laughs> You're just bored. Yeah. You're just bored. Yeah. You know, the other thing that's so annoying about that is that the driving thing, he has to be in the front seat. Otherwise, and if we're going, if we're somewhere where we have, we've never been before, that's your fucking job as the shotgun. Is no, I'm in the front to, asleep. Yeah. supposed to be help, <laughs> help with navigation. Yeah. This so, turn's coming up. Like, I, hey, I know this information. You guys are dicks. While you're talking, I see Doug shaking his head like, Sal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we all hate it. Because yeah, <laughs> so, it we've all at one point been in a situation where we're like relying on you to do that. It's like, oh, don't worry. I'll drive and look it up on the we phone missed, at the same time. Like, at least 20 exits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you you know, when we sat around over it, um, uh, when we went to the NCI event, this is the type of stuff that we, we started sharing with the, yeah. the people that were there. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. You could just tell that they, they they love hearing all the behind the scenes stuff with like, you know, Doug's fucking crazy and like, you know, <laughs> snap, <laughs> snapped on Sal and snaps <laughs> at the airport and stuff like that. And everyone's like, really, Doug? It's like, well, Doug? that Florida trip was was stressful. Yeah. When he lost it. Yeah, we oh told, we told God, that story. We told the story where that. he or he thought he lost the laptop. And yeah. he brings his, he finally comes up. The we're about to close the door and, and, the, and you got to fit your carry on in that little box. Otherwise, it won't let you on the plane. Yeah. And the lady's like, uh, you know, Doug's all like sweating. Like he barely made it. And the, can you put your carry on in there? And Doug tries to put it in. It doesn't fit. She's like, I'm sorry, sir. It doesn't fit. It's He's like, fit. it's fucking. <laughs> <laughs> all, of, all of us kept, we're like, ooh, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> we're all, get on the plane. Just go, just go on the plane. <laughs> Let them pass. It was a good time. It was a good time. No, it's only funny because you're the nicest guy. Well, I mean, that, and that's yeah. what I think. That's, I, I mean, that's I, that's Sal and I said totally. that, right? So yeah. the reason why it's so great is because it never happens, right? So it's like, no, we, no, no. We've been no. together, what? Six, Adam's mad 90% of the time. So it's, it's it's not a funny that's story. Exactly. If yeah, I tell someone, like, oh, kind yeah, of a given. Duh. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah. seen him get mad like that yesterday. It just happened. I'm just, yesterday. I'm passionate. I'm passionate, <laughs> no, I'm passionate about it. Moody. It's, I'll it's call it Moody. Just, stop calling me Moody. <laughs> I know. Everybody thinks I'm, I'm, I'm on my period all the time. I don't like, know. No, it's it's just maybe. Passionate. Hey, passionate so, so I want to tell you guys about some cool, uh, some more cool studies. They did a, they're, they're using VR therapy. I don't know if you know this. They're testing VR therapy on people with uh, claustrophobia and people with agoraphobia. Do you guys know what they're, they're testing that? Like they're like torturing Wait. people? By so do you know what agor agoraphobia is? is? Is that blood, right? No. No, What's is that, that just like a fear of being around people? Like general, fear or? of open spaces? Or open spaces. So oh. you'll get people are so afraid that what's, they'll- What's blood one? What's blood? Doug, fear of blood. Know. Oh, dog. You almost always know what I, do that. I don't know that one. Yeah, oh, I have no um, idea. It sounds like it would be agoraphobia. I, I did. I thought that's what it was. Go Gory. Gory phobia. That's yeah. what you have. We don't like scary Andrew, movies. Andrew, you like you got it over there? Hemophobia. Oh, oh, hemophobia. Yes. Hemophobia. Like hemoglobin? Is that what Well, it is? that's yeah. crazy with, oh, man, claustrophobia. I, you know, so I've been in a couple situations where I was you have like a little bit caving. Of that, huh? Well, yeah, because like once I got a certain size, it, it, it was like, I can't <laughs> fit through all these things and, and, you know, do, do stuff as like I used to do as a kid. I was a lot more adventurous and would explore. And we went uh, in this cave and there was one way through and it was like, it was a tight hole and Ooh. I had to just like get the shoulders through. And it, Did you start panicking? Yeah. 
Yeah, I start sweating and then was like, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't do it. I'm well, start hyperventilating and then somebody with me was like trying to calm me down. Oh my Cause god! Because I couldn't, I couldn't like push. I didn't know whether to go forward or back. I was like stuck. I feel like I have a little bit of it too. Ugh, it makes I think me, it's it makes me freak I do, out a little I do bit right it's now. Like a, when you got bigger, <laughs> you get bigger. You feel like there's places that you're not supposed yeah, to go. Yeah, there's just some places you don't do. You don't go there because I don't want to get stuck. It's a normal. It's a normal fear. I think it's when it gets. It's also why I don't want to be buried. I'd rather be cremated. You're gonna be dead. Uh, Nobody cares. It doesn't matter. I still have this. Uh, this just the <laughs> thought of being in a coffin. You know, I'm like, oh. No, you know what we're gonna do with you? What we're do gonna you be mean? Like, I thought you wanted to be paraded around like yeah. the well, that yeah. rapper that well, just, first. Uh, we're gonna have hey, then burn me up. We'll have a farewell yeah. meeting with mind pump. We'll prop up your body. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, want you, I want you to weaken at Bernie's me for yeah. a weekend. I'm gonna move okay? your arm and be like, God damn yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. For, <laughs> for, for a weekend, <laughs> I want you guys to throw the fattest party and yeah. then light me on fire. Wow. I'm serious. That's it. Just a rager, like a two day rager somewhere, and like. Hey, Perfect. I want to put you on a boat and then shoot. That's fine. A, uh, fire Burn me up however you want. I don't yeah. care. But just okay. party, hey, celebrate life. Hey, I don't we'll want any sadness. We'll, we'll, we'll give everybody a candle so yeah. everybody could just walk up and light them a little bit. Yeah. Or may, <laughs> make, hey, make a fucking carnival game out of it. I don't care. Throw me out there in the water and I yeah. get people to take turns like trying to get it. Oh, you know yeah. what I'm saying? And then yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Write, write a message to Adam on his chest before yeah. we light him on fire. Right. <laughs> I For some reason, that doesn't make my skin crawl the same way being thinking about being buried. No, well, so, you know, one time I did experience a little bit of it. I was in an elevator. This is a true story. I went in an elevator with my big ass Italian family who never does anything by themselves. They always have to go in the same elevator together. No, they the same stuck. everything. We went on elevator and literally packed ourselves in there because every, nobody wants to wait for the next one. So we're packed. The doors close and then the thing goes and then it slowly starts oh, to go God. down. Oh, and we God. have to wait. We call them and we're like, hey, the elevator's not working. And they're like, you have to wait till it gets to the bottom. We were on the 13th floor. It took like 20 minutes to slowly go down Ugh. and we're just stuck in there. And my grandma started freaking out a little bit and I'm trying to tell jokes, get everybody to start laughing. It was, it was, it was That bad. reminds me of that story I told you guys of my bipolar ex-girlfriend. Remember farts. that one? Oh yeah. yeah. I was stuck on the elevator like that at the Circus Circus. She lost her shit. Yeah. It was like on the 50th floor on the way down. It was like on a, like a 4th of July weekend and stopped at every floor. Hey, I wonder if she knows, you, if she's listening, if she knows it's her. She has to. Oh, of course she She's has the to. bipolar. I, I haven't dated that many bipolar chicks. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? Yeah. I don't know. Your that's car not got stolen that's twice. Not like it's, that's not like a, like Is I'm just saying that. Me? Like she like literally was. I remember like we were months into dating and, and yeah. I found that out. I was like, oh my God, I did not know this. And I'm like, well, what, like, about I'm the, ride the what good medication part. do you use? Yeah. Oh, I just smoke weed instead. I'm like, oh, wow. Oh, no. like, I don't think that's working. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ride the fun part. When it gets to the bad part, then we're going to break up. Well, what they're doing with the VR is they're, because because people are so afraid to venture outside, mm -hmm. they're more likely to desensitize themselves with the VR goggles. So they'll put them on and then they'll explore outside in the goggles, slowly desensitizing themselves. Oh, right. interesting. Yeah. So then they'll be able to take the step outside. Yeah, I know we were joking. Like exposure I, therapy or whatever. Yeah, yes, right? Yes, yes. Oh, yes, that's yes, interesting. Yes. I, wonder, I wonder how successful that would be. Like, you would think that if you're in that, that it would, because those things feel so real, right? Like, you would think that would freak them out. They still. do, but exposure therapy is actually quite effective. So people have all kinds of fears, arachnophobia or whatever. Oh, they'll yeah. they'll slowly expose you. Put spiders all over you. And, yeah. Hey, Ooh. keep in mind, though, this is also how I told you they're going to sell this to us too, right? I said that already. Like, they're going to start... We're going to see more and more positive stuff come out about virtual reality and being plugged in. And I just think that you're, we're all being groomed to move in that direction. Of, you might be right. I do. And they, and you're already proving what I said is that you're going to start seeing these. I mean, I wait till they do depression. Yeah. Wait till you get somebody who is, uh, who's uh, socially depressed and locked up in their house and it, it gets social anxiety. And then they get into the virtual world and it improves their life. And then you have studies to support these groups of people that it's made, made life think, better for them. I, you know what? I can see what you're saying. I don't know if the studies will show that it'll improve because there's, it's more complex than that, but I agree. I mean, it's like, it's like if you made a list, Real Come on, world. you and I both know that's how, I mean, studies will prove whatever they want it to prove. That's true. You know it, what I'm it'll, saying? it'll be like real world versus VR. Like real world, there's killers out there, viruses, <laughs> yeah. dangers yeah. inside the VR. It's totally safe. No hey, killers. watch. Yeah, yeah I, I, I totally know. believe that's coming. Speaking like that. of uh, of claustrophobia and stuff, are you guys Don't seeing- Don't take mushrooms and do it at the same time. Oh my that's, God. <laughs> that's, that'll really mess you up. Are you guys seeing the, the news that's leaking out of Shanghai? No. The lockdown? No. Okay. Oh, I've seen some videos of uh, people panicking and like not being able to have food and we're just they, breaking stuff and okay. So crazy. Chi the, the policy in China with COVID is zero COVID policy, and because they're communists and they have total control, 
they can literally, and they do, lock people in their homes. And they did this for the whole city. So crazy. Of Shanghai, which good luck trying to still control the virus. It's still spreading. But nonetheless, they've locked people in their homes. People are starving to death. There was a video uh, at night where someone was recording, and it all you hear- It doesn't even work. Well, you they, hear, it's like, like, on, all draw. you hear people screaming oh, outside the window. Like, bah, bah, because they're so like, didn't, their minds. didn't a, a thing just come out that uh, they did where they compared all the states in the United States on who handled who handled COVID the best, and yeah. didn't Florida come out on top? Well, yeah, what they do they is, the top ones. What they do, when you do all the controls, uh, the studies came out showing that the strictest mask mandates and lockdowns really had uh, almost insignificant impact. And if you count- Depression, yeah. economic uh, yeah, meanwhile, activity. Meanwhile, the worst economic impacts. Yeah, they're, they're basically the basically people. saying it's not that wasn't a good it wasn't a good. Strategy. The part that I find ironic most about that is I also believe that Florida has the the oldest popu population. They too. have to control that. So when you, oh they they control they do, that. Yeah, they oh, okay, control so that. that's not that's not a fact. No, they do control oh, okay. that. But then but with uh, that would be crazy when you. Well, think about here's the way I look at it. I, you know, I know we could do lots of studies and stuff, <clears> but for me, the ultimate proof is where are people moving to and where are people leaving? Yeah. And the places that were the most strict have lost residents and the places that were less strict have gained residents. That's all the evidence that I need because I yeah, don't think- Regardless of how they try and spin it, you see which places are thriving and which aren't. Yeah. And, and so, which has the most homeless and yeah. you know which are actually like uh, booming but, places but to, to live. Dude, this thing with Shanghai is crazy. Some people are protesting by putting their refrigerator on their uh, balcony with the refrigerator open. open so people could take pictures and see like we're starving. Uh, cats and dogs are being caught on the street, killed- some people think they're being fed. Dude, they're taking people's kids too. Kids, if your child had, was COVID positive, they would forcibly separate your child, bring your child what? to state. It's, it's now. disgusting, man. It's crazy. Like I, this What's should make on? everybody's skin crawl. Yeah, and I, I think that there's uh, there, there there may be some riots and stuff that might be happening over there. It's really wild. Yeah, wow. That people yeah, would even blame them. It's crazy that some people even them. advocated for that here. There were some people who were like, just lock people up. And lock them in, inside, and we'll get through this. Well, you, I think people you brought, are. Didn't so you bring up that about fear. people would give up their fear for safety? That's wasn't there. Always. Wasn't there a study on that? Oh, like there's a, lots of studies on that. Yeah, that yeah. show that people would the false uh, promise of, of of safety. People will lovely. They'll give up all kinds of shit. Yeah, just for the for the promise, not the actual. And I think that's what <laughs> the, the example. Delivery. Yeah, that's the, that was the promise. This is how we're going to slow the curve down by doing this, and that was enough for. A percentage of people. I mean, you still see it right now. I mean, it, we we live. We're one of the last states to you know lift everything, but I still go places where it's not even mandatory anymore, and you still got people. It's just, yeah. I feel bad. I, people got really scared, and I feel bad for them. And I was talking to Arthur Brooks about this, and he goes, "You know, he goes, it's probably not cool to make fun of that." He goes, "Because a lot of people got traumatized by that whole situation." You know, my kids, my daughter goes to school in sixth grade. Most of the kids still want to wear masks. Now, part of it, I think, is at that age, for two years, they wore masks. Yeah. So now they feel self-conscious taking it off. awkward stage. Yeah. So it's, 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 there's stuff we haven't even seen. You know, I, it's so good. Justin, maybe, I don't know if you thought about this because you were like me, uh, not as bad. Actually, I think I was worse when I was younger. Um, it, at her age, right? So I had really crooked teeth and I was very insecure about it. And if oh, the yeah. mask thing was like a thing- Especially I, if you wore it for two years at well, that Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, and it was already something we're doing. Like, I wonder, like even myself, like if I would have been a kid that would have done it. And part of me thinks that I might've. I was hmm. so insecure about my teeth yeah. when I was a kid like that. that, that age. That I was all, I already did it when I like smiled, you know, I smiled a crooked smile or didn't show my teeth. And so yeah. if I had this mask that could cover it up all the time, it would make me feel probably more secure and confident. When you see a kid, what, okay, what is the stereotypical? Which is bad, by the way. I don't think that would be a good no, thing. No, no, no. So, What's the stereotypical, no. um, like you think of a kid that's like anxious or depressed? What do they do? They have their hair in front of their face, mm -hmm. or they wear a hoodie. Yeah. They don't want to, or they look down or because they don't want to be hat, hat yeah, real low. To hide in. Okay, yeah. so I feel like that feedback can go backwards too. Mm -hmm. As you cover yourself and you see less people's faces, you're probably sending a signal to yourself that says, "And look, and yeah. anxiety, I isolate myself. Anxiety, sadness, depression has exploded among kids." So, and I'm sure that's one factor. There's lots of factors because it's been a tough couple of years. Yeah. yeah. But I don't, I don't think, I, I think we're not, we haven't, we haven't paid the price I mean, yet. it made sense after you said that because then I would, I, I also see sometimes where I see like a family walking together and then I see like the kid just wearing a mask and not the parents. Because they're I'm more like, comfortable with it And I'm like, that's all. fucking weird. Well, Do you know how talking long? about this? Because in gymnastics, there was a few kids that were still wearing them in the, the, parents we talked to and, and they were all about like the mask being lifted, but. They couldn't convince their kid yeah. to take it off. That's They're so just, well, they want to keep it on there. Two years for a kid is a long time. 
Think about that. My daughter was in fourth grade. Well, yeah, it's like a third of their life when they're yeah, in dude. Young. It's yeah. like for us, it'd be like you know, ten years. Like it's, yeah. you get used to yeah. it. Like this is just the way it is. And yeah. It's weird to take it off. Yeah. So I don't know. Man. I mean, it's, we we had a little mass burning party at my house. Did you really? Yeah. You did not. Did we you? Certainly <laughs> did. You so did. <laughs> yeah. Dude. Well, because my kids were <laughs> were a little on the other end of that spectrum. We we're like fighting it the whole time, and we get in trouble, and I'd have to talk to the teacher, and then this and that and the other, and then finally. You know, they're like, okay, you don't have to wear them. I'm like, yeah. And so, like, they I brought mean, they brought me then. We made a little pile. I just set it on fire. I mean, so you, how do you handle it as a dad? There's got to be a part of you that you're like, you got to go through the whole, jump through the hoops with the teacher and be like, I'm sorry. Talk to the kids potentially. But then you're also like, listen, kid, it's it's cool. I understand. Yeah, you well, through. I know. I mean, it how, is, how do you do that? It's one of those things. It's a delicate dance because it's something that, um, you know, everybody has their own belief system and has their own uh, values and whatnot. And I have to stay true to my own values and my own belief system. And it was one of those things. It's like, I don't think this is right. And so I, you know, uh, to, to be cool and, and to, if, if it's something that's like standardized and like every kid has to do this in order to show up to school, like we'll, we'll follow the rules. But like, if there's opportunities for him to take it off at recess yeah. and, and you're outside and all that, take it off, you know, yeah. or like, I really don't, it didn't bother me that they were pushing back because yeah. I feel like a lot of this needed to be pushed back because people were leading with fear. Yeah, yeah. And leading with fear is a bad place kids, to be. Kids don't use them properly. They don't use a proper medical protocol. No, nobody was using an N95. It's actually a big. It's a big show. If that of. was the case, the N95, then you have a new argument for me. Yeah, because I'm. I just go by data and yeah. like what actually and the works. medical protocol you, yes. know, you know what the training that actually looks like? works you know what the training looks like when you in, when you're learning how to wear all the nurses will tell you that they have to go through an extensive training yeah. just it's to, not like you, you reuse the same one or kids scratch their face or touch it all the no, time and they're touching other things it's like they're actually increasing maybe even increasing the risk or negating whatever safety they're getting yeah, from it it's all a show yeah I, all... I, I, when we were getting on the plane there was yeah this, i thought, there was... were, I thought we were going to see a situation because oh a i late, was lady. i told adam i said i'll get kicked off this plane right now this 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 Parents had this little boy. They had two little kids. Two little kids and little boys, obviously, you know, it's hard with two kids. And the the flight attendant's like, oh, you know, he's going to have to wear a mask. And the guy's like, I know. And, I, and the kid is like squirming. And I'm like- He's like if, Max's age. He's probably I'm, like two and a half. I'm like, if they make them leave the plane, I'm going to throw a strike. I'm going to get everybody on the plane. Early to in, they would have probably. Oh, yeah. Did. Oh, yeah. Early. That's why- they the, fact that she, the fact that she even said something like already, like at where we're at now, that, oh my God, this is, I hope this doesn't go two, here right yeah, now. He's like, he's like, he's like two years old. Far, dude. Yeah. Like, what are you going to- you know, Yeah, there's no leg to stand on with that for me. Anyway, I'm going to take a left here and I'm going to talk about- That's a right. This is right. Yeah. But if you're watching, <laughs> it's, it's, it's left hey, the audience. If you're watching, it's, it's still a right. No. <laughs> to them, it's their left. A la derecha, yeah. a la izquierda. Yeah. So hold on. I got to do this right here. Oh, yeah. That's right. Left. Yeah. Right. That's, yeah. Um, uh, let's talk about protein for a second. Uh, this is an, I, I, get, I got a, some messages yesterday on Twitter. People asking me questions about protein, plant proteins versus animal proteins. Um, and as single sources, animal proteins are superior, but plant proteins can be quite good when they're combined with other plant proteins because of uh, combinations of amino acid profiles can be complementary. Okay, so what does that mean? That means if I take whey protein, it's got a great amino acid profile by itself. If I take pea protein, it's not a bad amino acid profile, but it's not as good as whey. But if I combine pea protein with, let's say, pumpkin seed protein or brown rice protein, you get the amino acids of the other proteins that complement you get a more complete um, bioavailable source of protein. So if you use plant protein, try to use one that doesn't have a single source. Uh, now, pea protein and soy protein have the best amino acid profiles, but you want ones with combinations. Can I just say something? I just, it, you, we're such splitting hairs with this bullshit. Yeah. I mean, really That's what true. matters is you hit your protein intake and get it there. And if, because here's what you see, uh, the people that sell whey, will use things to show that how much whey is superior than than vegan protein powders. People that are promoting vegan protein powders talk about how if you use a blend of protein powders, yeah. it's as as good, potentially superior than, especially if it's better for your gut health than whey protein is. At the end of the day, it's what what protein powder you you like and if it doesn't negatively affect yeah. you and you're hitting your- You assimilate the best. Yeah, yeah. Then. If you if it doesn't fuck you up, right? Obviously, if you, if taking whey fucks your stomach up, then go to go use a vegan protein yeah. powder. Yeah. But if it doesn't, it's it's fine. And it's great. And it's technically well, a little what you're superior. Saying, there's, there's a lot of truth to what Adam's saying in the sense that if your protein intake is high, 
It doesn't matter. It doesn't. No, if you hit your numbers, if you hit what if you... If it's low, that matters. If it's high, then... Yeah. It, it, and even then, right? Like, even then, if it's, like, low, like, you're not talking about the difference of someone losing five pounds of muscle that week because no, they... No, no. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. it's such a splitting hair difference that people get into these debates. It's, it's, a, it's one of the things I can't stand about our space. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's primarily driven by the people that are trying to sell one or the other to yeah. you. Yeah. And for the general population... Use the one that you like. Yeah, use the one that you like. That's that's for the most part, especially if you have a high protein diet. But uh, nonetheless, protein blends from plant protein. If you're one of those people that's paying attention, that's your best bet. Like yeah. Organifi, the company we work with, that's how their uh, plant protein is. It's yeah. a combination of different sources that are complementary, give you better. Which is why we work with them. We work yeah. with them because they're we think they're the one of the best, if not the best, in the space for that. But again, I feel like if you know if you yeah. like taking away, you take away because you enjoy it. If you like the vegan, then do it. You know, yep. and I, where I see it the best is like how what you how you talk about it. And I even notice it myself. If I get a lot of dairy in my diet, I do notice yeah, digestibility's got to be number. Yeah, one. I do. Yeah. I notice. I do notice the whey sometimes. But most time, I'm, I use whey protein powder last night. Totally fine. But I also hadn't had a lot of dairy the last couple of days. Hey, check this out. Look, if you like to enjoy alcohol occasionally because you're a healthy person. Sometimes it still feels like crap. So here's what happens. You drink alcohol, and sometimes you overcome your body's ability to break down a compound that is produced from the alcohol called acetaldehyde. If acetaldehyde builds up in your system, you get side effects like headache, uh, nausea. You can feel really crappy, digestive issues. Sounds like a hangover, right? Well, that's what happens when you get too much acetaldehyde. Well, check this out. There's a company called Z-Biotics that made the first genetically modified probiotic drink that actually breaks down acetaldehyde. So what happens is you drink Zbiotics, then you drink alcohol. And what these special bacteria do is they produce compounds that break down acetaldehyde. Now I've tested this myself several times. I've taken Zbiotics, then I went out with my friends, drank some alcohol. I feel way better the next day. This stuff really works. It's also patented, so you can't find this anywhere. You gotta try this out, especially if you're a health conscious individual. So if you wanna try it out, Head over to mindpumppartners.com, click on Zbiotics, and then use the code MINDPUMP22 for 10% off your first order. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Alex from South Carolina. What's happening, Alex? How can we help you? Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my question. So I've, I've been listening to the podcast for quite some time and have taken much of your advice to heart. Um, and so I'm a former college athlete, ex-crossfitter, and now jujitsu practitioner and avid lifter. I'd recently had a meniscus arthroscopy on my left knee, and I'm here for your advice. So I was slowly able to add back in some of my workload using mobility and sled work, and now I feel like I'm in a place where I'm, I was before my injury. So for my tendencies to overtrain as a former athlete, I've also experienced many minor injuries in my upper body over the years. And, and with your advice, I really dialed it back and have been able to optimally recover between workouts. Uh, I really went from working out every day pretty heavy to now going three or four days a week. And a lot of those shoulder and back arm problems have gone away. So my question for you are three. Is there an upper body uh, sled exercise, quote unquote? Like the sled was so instrumental in strengthening my knees. And I, now I do it every day. And I feel like that's really been the main um, remedy in coming over my meniscus surgery. Is there something I can do that uh, for the upper body, like a sled for the shoulders? Back stuff. Like a like a drag. Yeah. You know, the, right. the, the reason why the sled is so uh, helps so much with, recoveries because of the lack of the eccentric portion of the rep. So that's the lowering mm -hmm. part of a repetition. Mm -hmm. So you can do certain things with uh, like medicine balls and, and, and barbells that where you don't really uh, incorporate a lot of the eccentric. To be honest with you, I think isometrics would be one of your best mm -hmm. things to do for the upper body. Um, I mean, with the sled, you could, you could squat down and pull it with a rope so you can work the back. You could get into a good base and press it with your upper body so you can get some upper body work. But I think isometrics might be better uh, for some of your upper body stuff because of the lack of damage and then, of course, the the benefits that it can definitely provide. Yeah, I agree. Uh, like you could do chest passes with the medicine ball and get that uh, concentric without the eccentric portion. But, um, yeah, for the most part, um, being able to apply uh, rotation as well to, to reinforce – um, you know, that stability and strength around the joint was going to help tremendously. So to, to take it through full range of motion, but have uh, that connection, that isometric control within each portion of those angles, um, you know, that's you take the time to do that, go through, you know, what we have in a lot of like our prime programs where we're 
doing um, wall circles, for instance, or wall press, um, and, and really like hyper connect there, uh, that's going to do you a lot of good. Alex, what's the main reason why you want to do uh, sled stuff for the upper body? Well, I just feel like the the sled is it kind of does a lot of things. It's it's a little bit aerobic. It's also strength training, but I feel like it's it's also just strengthening the joint itself. So I, it's preventative, I think, in a lot of ways, because I don't go crazy heavy on it. Yeah. And I do multi-planar. I go backwards, forwards. I do the karaoke. I heard you guys talking about like a, like, a, like a sideways version of it. And that's also been something that I like. Have you? Um, so, so I wonder if there's something like that for the shoulder. Well, so Halo's like with... Um with a, a dumbbell, it, it, you know, it's, it's going to promote mm -hmm. something similar to that in terms of like, even if, okay, if you have access to a mace bell, um, and this is part of the, mm -hmm. you know, that the appeal of that is like, I can get into, um, those types of positions where you know, I have to be able to control and, and be able to have strength, um, you know, to, to be able to, um, pull it back in, in front of my chest. Um, it, it, you're, you're adding load in a sense. So you're also strengthening, uh, the rotators with that, which is something that, uh, is very similar to what you're experiencing with your legs in the sled. I really like the, uh, suspension trainer for this too, mm -hmm. especially since we're looking mm -hmm. for stability in the shoulder and stuff. I just think that's a, that's a great, and you can regress it or progress it in so many different ways. Do you have a suspension trainer? I don't have a suspension trainer, but I have a mace. So. I okay. could definitely get the mace incorporated at least. The suspension trainer like rings, or what do you mean by that? Yeah, it's like TRX. Yeah, we we sell it on okay, our okay. at our Mind Pump store uh, website. In fact, if you when you get the suspension trainer program, I think they send you a, a fifty percent off coupon for it too. So if you don't, I do have access to those actually at the gym. Okay. Yeah. Oh shit, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Then there you go, and we have a whole program that's around it with all kinds of exercises in it. But I I would start incorporating yeah. some uh, upper body stuff with that. I think that mm. that will you'll see some good benefit from that too. Mm, okay. I guess the other two questions I had, they're, it's, they're kind of related. Um, but when I was strengthening my knees, I've been doing a lot of mobility as well. And, and I really tried to get uh, as low as I can on my squats. And so I'm, I'm pretty consistent with a heavy squat at parallel. And I've heard you guys talk about it recently on a podcast about getting full range of motion with as much strength and control as you have. And, and ultimately, I'd like to get ass to grass. But really, it, I, I question is it better to try to get ass to grass every time with full range of motion that I can get, or is it better to just accept the range of motion of parallel that I have and go heavier some days and, and lighter some days? Like how do you balance like optimizing, increasing your mobility in those movements, but also improving your strength gains or do you focus on one or the other? Well, what, what happens when you break the, when you do a squat right now, and if you say you go to parallel, mm -hmm. just fine. But what happens when you break parallel? What, what, what do you see break down in your body? Do you, Roll your shoulders I forward, lean forward. And you lean forward. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's my ankles. I think that's it's the ankle mobility. Oh, there you mm. go. Um, but I think, you know, so it's, it's it's like I can get parallel pretty good. And then as minute I go a little too low, my back starts to arch and lean forward. And I'm like, I don't want to do this and well, injure myself. Well, consider this. Like, let's say you could squat 200 pounds, but go down to parallel. But you could only squat 150 pounds, but go three inches lower, both with mm -hmm. good form. Okay, so so all things being equal, right? Both good form. But the mm -hmm. intensity is equal. In other words, the 150 pounds at three inches lower is the same intensity as the 200 pounds at parallel. Which one's going to give you better results? Well, the one with the mm -hmm. greater range of motion. So the, the, the goal should be to train for greater ranges of motion. But of course, you have to control them and have the stability and the mobility to do so. You're not trading. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're not trading results because you're working on a deeper range of motion or working on mobility to do so if anything you're actually you're you're going to get better results that way also a way for you to test if for sure it's the ankles is if you do a you know elevate ele hill elevated squat so you know get your heels up on like a, mm -hmm. a a block or something and if you can drop all the way ass to grass then it is your ankles and everything else yeah, that, so that definitely helped before okay. so doing the ankle yeah ankle elevation yeah so and then i guess Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say then that then then work on that. I mean, and and you can do like a like a lot of times when I'm like really trying to improve the depth, I'm lightweight and then I'm I'm going to do combat stretch before I start. I'm going to do a squat and kind of pay attention either with my camera or the mirror, see how deep I get. Then I'm going to go back to doing the combat stretch some more and then I go back to the squat, see if I can get a little bit more depth and control and I just kind of go when the when the goal is to increase the range of motion. I'm treating it that way that we're, we're, we're doing mobility intermittently through the workout to see if I can get deeper and deeper through it and versus just doing your mobility. And then I'm just going to push the limits on my squats for the next five sets. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's actually a really good idea. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I guess the last part was, um, so with the knee, I kind of jumped back into at a stepwise progression of weightlifting. And one thing I was kind of concerned with is deficits in one side or the other and, and how is a good way to search for those discrepancies. I feel like when I'm squatting, I'm not sure if it's just in my head or if there's like an objective way to measure whether or not I was favoring the other knee and predisposing that to injury. And if you do have deficits, how do you re- recommend like yeah, looking at it and correcting e- for them? Easy. Unilateral exercises. We'll show you that mm. uh, pretty clearly. You know mm. what I'm going to do, Alex? I'm going to send you our new program. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you've recommended two of the things from our yeah. new program. I'm going right to send you our new program, oh, map, map Symmetry. I think it'll be perfect for yeah. everything that you're looking for. Um, and it'll, it'll help balance out right to left. It's going to help with the upper body stability and control. It's basically going to give you everything you want. It's a brand new program. We just came out with it. So I don't know if you're familiar with it, but uh, there's a, a phase of isometrics and there's two phases of unilateral training. At the end, you get to have fun and do some five by five type stuff. So I think you'll like it. Well, that's awesome, guys. I really appreciate it. You got Thank it, you man. so much for the yeah. podcast nope. and, and letting me talk on it. So appreciate it, guys. No problem. Thanks for calling in. Mm-hmm. I was waiting for the symmetry recommendation yeah. there. It's, it's really, a, uh, <laughs> it's pretty, uh, it's pretty funny how many yeah, issues, we built it. yeah, how many issues a map symmetry would, 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 uh, would target. I mean, all the stuff that he said yeah. right. was perfect. Uh, I mean, that's, I think why we're so excited to release this program, but, um, I think it's, I mean, unilateral training has so much, I, in fact, I just read a study where they were comparing muscle fiber recruitment pattern or muscle fiber recruitment with bilateral versus, uh, unilateral unilateral training activates more muscle fibers mm. in the same in the same muscles if it was worked uh, bilaterally. Is that because of the stability yeah, component? Has to be- no, I think it's just the force. You're, you're focusing all your force on one limb. Oh, interesting. Mm. And, you know, obviously your whole body's More tense. directional. Yeah, way. and you see more of that. And bodybuilders have talked about that for a long it's time. It's got to so. be the stability component too, though, right? Yeah. I mean, you got to think if you're doing like a single arm shoulder press that there's a lot more. You, you don't have the counterbalance sure. on the other side to help stabilize, right? So yeah, but I think they yeah, compare divert to... <laughs> I can't even talk. Never heard. <laughs> I'm done. I'm checked out. Yeah. No, I think they're comparing the, uh, they compare two dumbbells to one dumbbell. So it's like bicep curl, one arm, di- bicep curls, both arms, even with dumbbells, oh, the bicep with one arm, uh, will get, you'll see more muscle fiber, uh, recruitment. So it's very, very interesting. I think this is a big missing piece to a lot of people's programs. It sounds like he's yeah. already on the right track though. I think he's just look, like, you know, typical athlete looking for more to do. I mean, just by simply reducing the volume and everything, he said he started to yeah. notice pain and everything go away and working on the sled, done all these wonders yeah, for him. That's an interesting angle, though, like trying to think of something that beneficial for the upper body because it, it is so interesting what the sled provides that nothing else really does. And, and I really do think, and that's why I'm so vocal about the whole rotational thing because people yeah. just don't consider it. You can load it you know, progressively, yeah. and it's something that will have massive benefit and carry over and make you feel like you're you're able to produce a lot more force in the shoulders. So. Lo- this is why I love the suspension trainer too, though. I mean, the the the, the stability component, how the depth you can get, you get like, a crazy stretch, you get oh, more range of motion. Yeah, when I do when I that. do the push ups with the the suspension trainer, I feel like it just wakes my my shoulders up completely because of the the depth that I can get on it, the stability component of my body weight on it. I just I, I love that. Well, the isometrics in the beginning of symmetry, we utilize uh, some of those suspension trainers too. So he's going to get all that with this program. So I think he'll be happy. Sweet. Our next caller is Matthew from Georgia. What's up, Matthew? How can we help you? Hey, guys. What's up? What's going on? Hey. Um, First of all, thank you guys for having me. You guys are great. I've loved listening to you guys for about the past year or so. So super excited to be here. Um, So yeah, uh, I'll start with kind of a little bit of background on me and my fitness and then go into the questions. So growing up, I was always kind of like a bigger kid, and that was something I struggled with for a while. Around my high school, sophomore year of high school, I was weighing around 200 pounds and pretty unhappy about it, but didn't really do much. Um, around that time from like work and stuff, I kind of just started changing some little things and didn't realize it, but I'd started to lose some weight. Um, so during Thanksgiving, like all my family was like, wow, Matthew, you're looking really good. And I kind of started to like really like that. And so I started losing a lot of weight and kind of crash dieting. So from one 200, I dropped to somewhere in like 150 range. Um, during that, I was doing kind of like a high intensity interval CrossFit training, but I was under eating, not sleeping well. So I didn't really see much results, kind of stuck in that skinny fat, if you will. Um, eventually, I did kind of find the light and started resistance training. Um, I started on a basic push pull leg split and started eating a lot more, caring about everything, went from around 160 to 170 in a couple months. Um, I stalled out, but I'd seen 
some good results. And then comes in kind of my coach that I talked about in my question, who's one of the greatest people I've ever met. He's coaches me um, super selflessly and everything. And he got me into powerlifting, um, which I've really started to enjoy. So last November was my first competition. I put around around 10 pounds since that competition. Um, did like a 15 week cycle up to it, hit the competition, went eight for nine, super fun. And then my off season came, I did around a nine week hypertrophy block. Um, my coach, he's the one who introduced me to you guys. He kind of gave me a blend of, uh, anabolic and aesthetic to do during then. Now I'm in a 15 week cycle leading to my next meet. Um, uh, and then just for a little reference last year, I was probably squatting around 315, benching 185, deadlifting in the 350s, now squatting in the low 400s, benching 225 and deadlifting in the upper fours, hopefully 500. So really good strength gains, but I haven't seen a lot of aesthetic gains that I would have liked. Um, so after this meet, I was wanting to do some type of cut and lower my body fat percentage um, for some of the excess fat, I guess you could say I put on this past year. Um, I've really always kind of wanted to do this and feel good about myself because I never really was there to begin with. Um, but my coach says it'd be super counterintuitive to do um, that I should continue to maintain or maybe bulk up and then drop down to my weight class. That kind of a cut this summer after my meet would have really hurt my strength gains going forward. I do, I would like to kind of compete in the collegiate nationals in a couple of years, um, but that's a little out. So would cutting this summer really hurt my strength or could I bounce back from it or kind of what would that look like? Can we look at your blood? Uh, <laughs> we need more. Sorry, de- we need more. De- Justin's being sarcastic because of all, the, all the detail, <laughs> teasing, all bro. the detail Ma- you gave Matthew- us. That was more than enough detail. <laughs> Matthew, sorry, you- I like to be clear. <laughs> no, no, that's good. You're, yeah, you're you- very analytical. You <laughs> like your, uh, you like your coach, yeah. Yeah, he's awesome. Craig huh? is one of the greatest coaches. So, really? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so check this out. All I know about you is what you just said. Even though you gave us a ton of information, that's all I know. Your coach knows you way better than yeah. any of us do. Mm-hmm. So you got to take your coach's advice. I think your coach knows what they're talking about more than I will with the limited uh, information that I have on you. And plus, he's a powerlifting coach. He or she's a powerlifting coach. Um, I'm not a specific powerlifting coach. None of us are. So I would take their advice. I think they know what they're talking about. And based off of what you're saying, I think I'd probably agree with them. But again, they have the information. And and this is a good message for other people is that if you have someone you trust who's really good – who's working with you. I've done this with clients where they question a lot of what I do and they'll ask their friends or they'll ask other people to validate <laughs> like how they feel. Mom or dad. And I tell you what, your, your, your coach knows you. They've been working with you for a while. So maybe they think a cut would be counterintuitive because of the psychological component. I don't know what your calories are at. Maybe your calories are too low still and they want to see the calories come up. Maybe they feel less comfortable with you cutting now and waiting till you get closer to the competition so you can come down to a weight class, like you said. So I I would go with your coach's advice. I think the dilemma here is that your coach probably knows what's best for you for you hitting potential PRs in your your powerlifting meet. And I think you selfishly have some things that you would like to do with your body. And so, and, and he's probably right. If you have a short 12 to 15 week window until our next meet, uh, you know, putting you in a caloric deficit. Cause here's the thing. When you get into, when you go into a cut, it's inevitable. You're going to lose some muscle too. You're, you know, you're, you're, you're going to lose a little bit well, of muscle. Definitely strength. Yeah. And yeah. strength. So, you know, he's, he's probably right. If we want to have the best meat possible in the next 12 to 15 weeks, our goal wouldn't be to get shredded or lean right now or, or loose. Now, uh, how important is hitting PRs and increasing your weight? Is it, or would you rather, you know, look a little bit better and then also still try and do a meat? I mean, you could technically do a mini cut for a little bit to try and lose a little bit of body fat and then go after it. But it absolutely, your coach is right. It could potentially affect your numbers when you go to your meet, but then maybe you look better than you have at a previous meet. And maybe that's really what you want more than you care about increasing your spent, your, your, your bench or squat or deadlift. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to make a guess here though, because you did a 50 pound crash diet with a bunch of uh, crazy training, right? So I'm going to guess that your, 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 your probably your metabolism probably needs a little bit more time. To build up. So we don't even know how I'm many around, calories you're eating. I'm at 3000. Okay. I did track from, so when I, my bad, I tracked from 160 to 180. Okay. So you're 180 at 3000 right now. Mm-hmm. Where does your coach want you to go before cutting it, cutting it down? Do they have, do you have a calorie goal? So right now, not necessarily. I'm 
my next meet is in five weeks and the cut would be after that meet. Okay. Um, but rather than cut, he would want me probably to go up to around 190 pounds. Okay. I see. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, and to be honest with you, like, a, like and you want to do like a two week cut, you said two to four. I mean, yeah. Yeah, nothing crazy because I know if I'm in it that long, it will really hurt. But well, okay, if you're gonna do a two, look, let's just be real here. If you're gonna do a two to four week cut in a way that's gonna minimize strength loss, you're gonna lose maybe three pounds of body fat. I mean, that's that's probably right around where you'll be. Now you can lose a little more, but you're gonna sacrifice a lot more strength and maybe some muscle. So what you're what you're arguing over is three pounds right. of body fat, and maybe to, that much, and also maybe to, to Sal's point, your coach knows you even better than we do, and maybe he knows your habits and knows that if he gives you the green light to cut, that you're going to do more than what you're supposed to do, and so the reason why he's telling that because he knows you better than us, so that that's a possibility. I mean, the fact that this guy is the one who introduced you to us probably he probably knows his shit. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's my I'm just impression. Gonna, that's yeah. the key. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so definitely. But, yeah, that's the key. Your coach called us, by the way, before you got on the phone. <laughs> I <laughs> wouldn't be surprised. Make sure you, you tell Matthew to do what I told Keep him. Keep it on the straight and narrow. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. we're pretending like we don't know. No, I, I think you should probably listen to your coach, to be honest with you, because um, you're looking at three pounds fat loss. I mean, if, if powerlifting yeah. is your your big thing, right? I mean, well, that's why I feel that's where I feel he's coming from. Right, right. he's your powerlifting coach. Like, yeah, he's just looking at like how to squeeze out and maximize, you know, the potential of your performance. He don't give a shit what your abs yeah, look like. He gives a shit about your abs, bro. <laughs> yeah, you know, why do you care so much? right now yeah let's wait till afterwards yeah all right that yeah that helps i think it's like i want powerlifting my thing but i also want to have i, I want to have it all you want to you, want you want need it too bro it's a, yeah you're not so alone most people are like happen, that but yeah, yeah. no it's yeah, yeah you got, but i'll tell you what focus it in powerlifting is still a great way to build a good physique it's you know it's not bodybuilding but it's still damn good yeah and through the process of building strength it looks like you're already getting your metabolism amp pretty well so at some point you're gonna be able to cut from a nice high caloric intake and the fat loss is going to be a lot easier. Uh, but I, you know, I'd give it some time right now. Have some fun with the powerlifting. That would be my advice. All right. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. No problem. Appreciate man. it. Totally not what he yeah, wanted to we hear. Should <laughs> if, if his coach is listening, we'll give you a free program. He's like, come on, aesthetic guys. Come on, guys. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm I mean, like, look, I got nothing for you. Obviously, it depends on the coach and the totally, trainer. Totally. But I remember clients would do that to me where, oh, where yeah, they'd be, yeah. oh, I want to cut all my ca you know carbs out or I want to have a liquid diet. And I'd say, no, here's why. Right. And they would go ask their friend for validation yeah. or something. Don't you remember else. the run a marathon? Don't you, don't you guys remember the famous clients that would bounce from trainer to trainer, yeah. even? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They'd hire one trainer and that trainer wouldn't give what they like what they said. They go the next one. Oh, they go like the next one. So. I had a client that did that, and yeah. and I said, "No, you're it's gonna you're gonna get hurt if we train that way." No, I like to train. No, it's gonna hurt you. And then finally, she you know she went and worked with the other trainer, and what happened? She got hurt. I mean, you know? the tr the truth and is, I, I, I kind of felt good about the it. The truth is, he could. He could <laughs> <laughs> no, I felt bad. Like I the truth is, myself, he could but. he could totally do this cut if he wanted to and get a little leaner and look a little better for or better for him from his perspective. Um, but there's definitely a risk that he will his numbers will go down. Yeah. And of course, a powerlifting coach who is trying to get his numbers up and that's what he cares about most. Yeah, and, it's and a conflicting goal. Yeah. So he's well, I like, mean, I don't give a shit I about I mean, it. realistically, he could go conservatively with the fat loss and lose like two or three pounds to minimize muscle like strength loss. Sure. Or he could go to aggressive for four weeks, lose eight pounds, and he's gonna see some muscle. Well, and, and that was my loss. and that was my point because yeah, he might get all excited and about it. It was your your original point, but what I was adding to that was that he, you know, he knows his, his coach knows him better than we know him. Yeah. And maybe he knows just like we know our clients. Like if I give my client a green light and I know they have a tendency to crash diet or do something crazy right. like that, I'm not going to give him the green light because I know he's going to push the limits and then he's going to end up losing strength. Yeah, that's it. Our next caller is Jessica from Oregon. Hey, Jessica, how can we help you? Hi, guys. Um, I have been consistently working out for a good year now, five, six days a week. I eat... Uh, what myself and others consider to be pretty healthy, love cooking, trying new recipes. But um, I'm basically looking for a way to make sure that my diet is balanced, getting the best nutrition I need, like making sure I got enough proteins, carbs, and fats, but not actually counting it. Like I don't see me counting macros, weighing food, necessarily doing that every single day really sustainable so is there a way that i can i don't know eyeball it or just know that i'm getting all the protein to get the results that i want with my workouts okay so you want you want signs that will tell you you're on the right track basically yeah 
Is that true? Okay. So, uh, well, first off, a high protein diet generally works for most people. Uh, now, some people get digestive issues with that, but most people mm -hmm. work well with that. So, I would aim for you know about about 0. 0.6 to maybe a gram of protein per pound of body weight. And now, I know you don't want to track, but it's a good idea to track once so you have an idea, and then you okay. can kind of stay in that general idea. So, if you don't mind me asking, how what's your body weight? I'm five three, like one fifteen, and I'm. Oh. 42. Okay. So, so like older, so like older where things are changing and I don't know, you know, like it's not like a, just a little bit harder. <laughs> yeah, no, I got you. Okay. So about 90 grams of protein is, is going to be plenty for someone like you. So if you had three meals, okay. figure out what 30 grams of protein looks like for each meal okay. and then okay. target that. Now, as far as like signs, well, your body fat percentage, your strength, your performance, how you feel, energy wise, your digestion, like these are all signs that tell you you're kind of on the right track. If you start to feel digestive issues or your, your energy is off, you start to feel weird, strange cravings. Um, th then, you know, maybe something's off. like if your strength goes down, maybe you're eating too little, but those are okay. kind of the things that you might want to monitor okay. while you're eating. But I mean, your body weight for your height is pretty good. Do you know if you're lean or, or like roughly where your body fat percentage is? I have no way to calculate that. Like I'm, I'm leaned. I know like the word tone does not always like your guys sure. favorite, but like I have good, like muscular definition more. So, yeah. That, but I'm working on improving lower body, like upper body, um, is real easy for me to get results. So okay. I'm been trying to lift heavier and switch my workouts a little bit. Not, you know, I've kind of been in that comfort zone for a while. So I'm trying to, push a little heavier, lift legs a little heavier. And so I just want to make sure that I'm feeding my body enough. Jessica, and Jessica have, you, have you ever uh, tracked before? Have you ever tracked your calories or tracked your protein intake? No, it, to, it just seems super overwhelming. Like it just, you know, and I listen to you guys and I listen to other people do it and it just, yeah, it seems really like overwhelming so to, to do it. My, my recommendation would be just for one month, track your protein. Just, okay. just so, and just so that when you eyeball your food, you have an idea of today yeah, is a that's good, because if you can't, if you have, if you've never tracked and you have no idea if you're hitting, if you like, you can't tell me the difference between a day where you get 30 grams of protein and a day you get 150 grams of protein. You, right. It, if you can't tell me the, the difference between the two, you're going to have a real hard time intuitively eating and making sure you're hitting your protein intake on a regular basis. And that is probably going to be the most impactful thing for you. You're at a pretty good weight. Um, right now, I think I, I, you're, I have a client that's actually the exact same, uh, <laughs> size as you are. And she looks okay. great. And this is actually the same conversation I'm always having with her is like, listen, okay. if we're strength training and you're consistent with that and you're keeping your weight around that same, so long as you're hitting your protein, we're going to, we're going to keep that tight look. You're going to have muscle and you're going to stay lean, but where you can get inconsistent is if you string four or five days in a row of you hitting 20, 30 grams of protein and just not getting enough protein to sustain the muscle on your body. And so that would, my recommendation would be don't overthink the counting. Don't get all crazy with the calories, just, you know, track and measure protein for a okay. month. So you can get an idea of the foods that you regularly eat. Oh, mm -hmm. that was, a, that's about 30 or so grams. Oh, that's about 20 yeah. or so grams. And so then when you go to eyeballing it going forward, you have a better understanding of what you're yeah. probably how do, how do you feel about your diet? Do you feel good? Do you have digestive issues? Do you have energy? Is your strength good? Like, give us a general I idea. I feel like my diet's like really good. Like on days when I lift, like lift heavier or, and like do like a really solid workout, I know I'm going to be really hungry all day. And that's true. So like, I make sure to eat, to compensate for that. Like I'm not, I'll eat like a good egg scramble with, you know, toast or like a, you know, wrap and try and get a sure. good balance of carbs to start the day and then consider, continue to eat at least, you know, every two hours because I'm that hungry to do that. And it's a lot of, you know, fresh, fresh food so that I feel like it's, I'm not damaging my body. I don't really, I don't have digestive stuff. I mean, I don't do milk. So everything's like, just because that does upset, but I do, you know, like Greek yogurt, cheeses, um, almond milk, that kind of stuff. And I really try and balance it. Cause I don't want to get bored eating a bunch of plain, like a broccoli rice type thing. Cause yeah. that's what, boring. What, what was the impetus <laughs> to ask the question about your diet? Then if you're feeling good, was it just cause you were just 
questioning or you're like, yeah, I'm just, yeah. yeah, I just want to make sure since I'm now being able to be consistent that I'm getting all the benefits from really okay. being able to stick to my workout schedule. Now I want to make sure that I'm also committing yeah. and doing a really good job balancing the diet so that everything works how right. it's supposed to. I, th- I think I have the best piece of advice for you then. Okay. <laughs> I want you to start to trust your, your body. Okay. okay. Because it will, it will lead you in the right direction. It sounds like you have a good grasp of, of how you feel and, and <laughs> how to feed yourself. It's, I, I'm just from talking to you. It sounds like you're doing pretty good. Trust your body because if you don't, what'll end up happening or what can happen. I've seen this many times is that someone's doing great, but because they don't trust their own body, they hop on this diet or they try this new thing and then they ignore the signals that their body tells them because, well, this is what I'm supposed to do. Like I just told you to eat 90 grams of protein a day. Well, what if you aim for 90 grams of protein and you get constipated? You don't feel good. Like ignore that, right? Then listen to your body. Maybe less protein is, is what you need. Although I don't think so. I'm just using that as an example, right. but, but trust your body. It's going to lead you um, in the right direction. My one, right. my one concern is just that you're, you're, you're small already. And so you probably mm-hmm. don't eat a ton of calories. And so when you have things like you could say, you know, chips and dip, or you have a drink on the <laughs> Saturdays, or you do things like that is you grossly uh, under consume protein in a, in, a, in a few days in a row. Like one day is not a big deal to have a low protein. In fact, we actually advocate for that. But if you mm-hmm. consistently under eat protein all the time and, but, but eat well, right. You you obviously, right. you don't, you're not over consuming calories. So that's keeping right. your weight where it's at. So that's fine. But if you want to tighten up more or have a firmer look or a little bit more mm-hmm. muscle to your body or more definition, then mm-hmm. it could be simply just making sure that you're getting adequate protein. And Sal's point okay. is still true. If I tell you to get, you know, bump your protein and then all of a sudden you have digestive issues, well then, yeah, that, I think that advice is good. But my guess would be that it, you simply just making sure you hit your protein on a regular basis, I think you'll see a little bit of shift in your body composition alone. Yeah. Uh, can I send okay. you, can I send you a workout program? Are you following any maps programs? No, not yet. I just listen to your guys' podcast and follow all the things on social media and just love it to where like my family makes fun of me. <laughs> uh, that's all right. I'm going to send you maps and a bulk. I think that'll be the, I think, I'm always like my mind pump guy said this today. And yeah. my husband's like, Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, that's great. Oh Lord. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to give you, I'm going to send you maps and a Okay. And then I'm also going to send you the intuitive nutrition guide. Cause I think that'll help you with your, with some of the questioning that you have with your, with your diet. So I'll, okay, send, I'll thanks, send those two things thanks. out to you. Okay. Right. Thanks guys. Thank you. I appreciate that. This was really great. It's helpful, positive stuff. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks Jessica. You know, it's funny is I had, so I was thinking as she was talking about like how people don't, when they don't track, they guess and they don't know. Yeah. I'll have female clients more often than not, it was female where they would uh, overestimate. Mm-hmm. Well, but that's a lot of protein. And oh, they'd yeah. be like, that's eight grams. <laughs> You're having yeah. eight grams. And then guys will go the opposite direction. Mm-hmm. I had a one, I remember I had one dude and he was like, no, I'm eating, that's how many calories I'm eating. Well, let me see your chicken breast that you have you know, for lunch and he pulls it out and I'm like, bro, that's like 12 ounces. That's a massive chicken breast. It's not the six ounces because he never weighed. So he had no idea what it looked like. And so he was without realizing he was eating, you know, too much. So if you got to get a good idea, you can't eat intuitive. And I think people mistake intuitive eating for, I'm going to naturally have this instinct. (laughs) Your body can trick you. Yeah. Your your mind can trick you, I should say uh, all the time. So yeah, it's, you got to have a basis established first. Well, so I think, well, you know, I think she just, even, I think she even gave us a little bit by, okay, she had breakfast, like she has a scramble or a wrap, right? Which, and with toast. Big and difference. Big, yeah. And you're talking about like, she probably is eat, that's probably eight, eight to 12 grams of protein. And then the rest carbohydrates. Yeah. And if you count that as a protein meal, and you need 90 grams yep. for your day, and that's one of your three meals you have, you're not even close to being on target. Mm-hmm. And then if you're not having a pound of meat later on, you're probably under consuming. And then what she didn't say, but I kind of pulled it out, is you know she likes the chips and dips and she drinks occasionally. So, yeah. And if she's keeping her calories to where she's not putting on a bunch of body fat, so she's, she's, she's managing that, that means when she drinks or she has those those chips and dip something is is she's not getting something else and uh, my guess is that it's probably not protein and if she's consistently doing that she's probably having a hard yeah. time building any more muscle i've never heard anybody describe like the like i'm really into dips like that's why we were speculating was she into like <laughs> chewing tobacco like, yeah. this is a new one for us no calories in that yeah. no it's like you, you go to starbucks and you see their 
They're high, they, Starbucks will have like foods. The high like protein, a, meal. high protein meal, and Eight it has grams. like it's got like five almonds <laughs> yeah. and like a piece of cheese. In it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> like, right. They always throw. What is high protein? You know. I don't know. No, I, I, people really don't know, but you know, it, it, you, it's like, okay, look, you can't ride a bike intuitively until you learn how to ride a bike first, right? You can't eat intuitively until you learn what's in food, how it affects you, what you need to eat, what's in this, what's in that. So you can't go in intuitively. Intuitive is not instinct, and we don't have that instinct. We have to learn it first, then you can move into more intuitive eating. Our next caller is Renzo from the Netherlands. Renzo, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey man, um, I'm actually uh, uh, wondering, uh, sending an email as well, like I'm practicing calisthenics quite a lot and I'm noticing that my pulling movements, they keep progressing and improve, uh, sorry, my pushing movements keep progressing and improving weekly, uh, but my pulling movements uh, are lacking behind. So I was wondering if you'd help me out with that. Sure. And you said this is all calisthenics or do you use uh, weights and machines too? Uh, no, I just do calisthenics. Uh, I do use resistance bands uh, to make it easier or, or tougher depending on the exercise, of course. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is your body weight staying the same or are you gaining weight? Um, I'm actually slowly losing weight. Uh, that's been staying the same pretty much the last few weeks though. Uh, but I made a new meal plan for myself because I kind of want to get a bit more ripped for summer, of course. Awesome. Uh, so it's slowly going a bit down again. Okay. And then last question is, is the volume the same for your pushing movements versus your pulling movements? Like same sets and reps and stuff? Uh, same sets, definitely. Uh, reps aren't really the same. Uh, I tend to do a bit more uh, pushing reps rather than pulling reps. Uh, I use supersets in workouts. Uh, I do you put uh, like pulling movements first and then follow up with the pushing movements uh, to make sure that I'm like, energized for the pulling movements. Um, but especially with like push-ups variations, I tend to do more reps than pull variations. How many, how many bodyweight pull-ups can you do right now? Uh, bodyweight pull-ups. I'm currently using resistance to make these here, but I think around five or six bodyweight pull-ups. Oh, okay, good. You know, I mean, uh, if you want to balance this out a little bit more, I would do a little less volume for the pushing and mm -hmm. keep the pulling volume the same and see if that translates more to, to strengthen the pulling movements. The other thing too is that strength gains aren't always equal around the whole body. The fact that mm -hmm. you're getting stronger generally is a good is a good thing. So that tells me you're moving in the right direction. If you're seeing some progress with the pulling movement, I wouldn't worry too much. Now, if you notice like pulling movements are like plateaued forever and your pushing movements are going up, well, then we would probably want to do a, a kind of a rehaul uh, of your workout programming. But you usually don't see this kind of linear progression or everything all at the same mm -hmm. time. You'll see, you'll see it on some stuff and on other things, you'll see kind of the step ladder mm -hmm. approach. I wouldn't worry too much about it aside from maybe cutting the volume down on the stuff that's just succeeding so well so that it allows your body to recover and adapt a little better for the other stuff. You're also losing weight, so you're in a calorie deficit. When was the last time mm -hmm. that you ran a calorie surplus? Uh, I actually didn't uh, run a calorie surplus in the last two years. Oh. Uh, I said as well, like the last two years, I've kind mm -hmm. of been cutting down on my weight because it wasn't my lowest, like, or highest weight, but my lowest uh, uh, mental well-being and such. Uh, so I haven't run any calorie surplus in the last two years. So I would, I would love to see you go on a, a small bulk where we go into mm -hmm. a calorie surplus. I would actually see if I can get you to either hold a weight or create some sort of uh, to where when you do pull-ups, you're only doing like one to three pull-ups and load it a little mm -hmm. bit while also being in this surplus for a while and see what that does. All right. It definitely sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, about like, like progressions, like I do have the feeling that when I'm doing my pulling movements, uh, uh, they're like small progressions happening as in i get my chest to the bar more often i've got more control and lowering down oh good so i do think that there are some progressions in there uh so i think it, it's not going too bad as i thought it was um actually after your uh, episode on asymmetry um i started filming myself a bit and i did notice that there's slight asymmetries in my pulling movements as well so i'm planning on working on that too yeah mm. so uh why don't we send you map symmetry that'll yeah. that'll balance you out yeah, but it, that'd be awesome. Lateral work uh, would definitely help to address a lot of that stuff. Are you noticing that too in your posture in terms of like some imbalances or asymmetry as a result of your uh, pulling movements lagging? Uh, no, I don't. My posture seems pretty okay. I do sometimes have the ID that my specifically left, left shoulder, left side uh, is, is moving different. I'd rather say in some occasions, I think especially with my scapula and my cooling indeed. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but besides that, it in general looks looks okay to me or feels yeah. okay to me. You know, sometimes, uh, Renzo, you're, you know, let's say like, for example, for me, I, I'll progress faster in pulling movements than I will pushing movements. But that's because years ago I had uh, shoulder surgery on my left shoulder and it affects me on my pushing movements, but not mm. on my pulling movements. Now, mm-hmm. that's just, a, that's a very clear example. But you may have some some issues, some stability issues that are that are really affecting you more when you pull than when you push, right? And that may be what's preventing the strength gains from from happening. There may be a equally. root issue to this that you could solve by really get diving into mobility a bit further and kind of seeing uh, where that lies. Um, yeah, that, that's something that I would kind of like really hyper focus on and yeah. get connected. Is, is there is there a reason why we're doing just calisthenics? Is there a reason why you, you're not using weights, barbells? Is there it, uh, it, it, it's mainly just uh, in, during high school years, I played a lot of field hockey and I was working a lot as well. So in my free time, I didn't really have the time to go to the fitness, to the gym and actually work out there. So I just started doing stuff with my own body. Um, and over time, I started just to simply enjoy that more. Uh, and especially like the fact that I'm just able to work out outside when it's sunny and that kind of stuff. Oh, cool. So are you totally against though, using the dumbbells and bar? I mean, like, like maybe uh, a bulk- I, No, I'm... I'm not against it. It's just I'm not used to it. Okay. Uh, and I do cool. like to figure out what the limits are of just my body. Oh, dude, you're uh-huh. going to love map symmetry. You're yeah. going to love that. We're going to send that to you. I think that'll, I think that'll, that'll solve some of your issues for sure. It definitely sounds good. You got it, man. Thanks for calling from all the way from the Netherlands, by the way. Yeah, I'm happy to. It's not too late here. So it's working out well. Yeah. Awesome. We, do we have a lot of fans out there? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Uh, I do listen to your podcast. Usually when I'm cycling to university, um, but I don't really hear, have I haven't heard other people talk about you guys. But it, I can imagine that a lot of people listen to you. We're gonna, yeah, we're going to need you to start asking everybody at school yeah. if you can. <laughs> you have to start wearing. I will. I will. And, and bring a <laughs> yeah. flag everywhere you go. Yeah, I, you know, I, I read a while ago that the average male height in the Netherlands was like six two or six one. Is that true? Are you guys all just massive? Why well, are well, all the uh, we are massive? Uh, but we don't use the same metric system. So like six two, six three. I'm not sure how to translate to centimeters. Oh, uh, so but like I myself five, am like one ninety. <laughs> Oh, okay. No. Okay. So just to give an example, like the, that's so six foot two is the average height over there in America. The average height, I think is five foot nine or five foot 10. So there's a big difference. So you guys are really tall. That's that's yeah, yeah we are. I, I'm actually in quite an international environment in my university. Uh, I think we've got over like 30 uh, different nationalities in my study alone. Oh, good deal. Uh, and the, the Dutch people do need like stand out pretty much. <laughs> yeah. well, well, good deal. Well, thanks for calling in. I hope you enjoy map symmetry. Uh, I hope so too. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Yeah. All right. You know, he brought up something that uh, we didn't really highlight that much, but I th- I found that almost always you have somebody who just has uh, a, a, a they're better at one or the other. Your preference. Yeah. You're either a g- better pusher or a better puller. Uh, I'm with you, Sal. I pull. I know yeah. Justin. You're a push. Yeah, I'm a pusher. And I feel <laughs> you guys are receivers. <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean. Uh, Pullers. Pullers. Yeah, sorry. Excuse <laughs> that me. That sounds weird. Yeah. yeah, but and but like what Sal you said is I'm the same way too. Like I I can gain quick. I get strong quick in most pulling movements, and there, it's just a slower process for me in pushing movements. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not really that big of a deal. Uh, if if nah. as long as you're overall progressing, I think is important. Where there tends to be an issue, like this is a clear one. Ex- some exercises are progressing, <laughs> and others are regressing. Yeah. Not super common, uh, but if that happens, you know there's an issue. Or if you just have this hard plateau, like it just hasn't moved and other lifts are, are moving up, and, then you want to look at your program. And it's always what you put emphasis on the most. Yeah. And that kind of fits into like what your strengths are already and like right. you reinforce that. But uh, I've noticed that too. Like if there's just certain lifts, I'm like, oh, wow, I'm not really as strong at this. So I just have to focus on this more and bring it more into the programming. Yeah. I also think, I mean, he's been on a two-year cut. I think a surplus for a little bit yeah. is going to help. That's going to help all of this. Yeah. Absolutely. And, it, and it's so funny. I feel like we're going to be giving out a lot of map symmetry. I feel like it answers <laughs> a lot of... <laughs> A lot of people's questions. Dude, I know. Well, we were talking about this all the time. Like, well, you guys should do like a unilateral program. You should throw some isometrics. Like, oh, pfft. well, we just created a program for that. Perfect. So now we're going to dole it out. Excellent. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal. 